Hi, everyone, and welcome to Innovate Finance's Leadership and Innovator Series. I'm Janine Hurt, the Chief, Op Chief Executive Officer of Innovate Finance, and I'm really excited to have with me today Christopher Reich, CEO and co-founder of IWOCA, one of Europe's largest business lenders. Now, before founding IWOCA in 2012, Christoph was a VP at Goldman Sachs and has had a long and established career within the space. So we're so excited to hear from you, Christoph, today, and thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Janine. Now, Christoph, the point of this series is really to hear from entrepreneurs and from change makers uh, about how they are transforming financial services. So I would love to kick off and really start firstly on your particular personal and professional journey. And we all know that starting a business is never easy. Uh, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey before you started IWOCA and what really inspired you to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, something something uh, happened that uh, made me uh, catch the buck to start my own own company. I think um, being in a in a very large company as I've been in, uh, you learn a huge amount. Uh, you're surrounded by by great people, but I just felt I didn't quite have the impact that um, that I wanted to have. Um, I was uh, in a sense part of a you know I was a small piece of um, of a very large organization. And, uh, and so increasingly, it became apparent to me over the years that um, I really wanted to start my own company, decide what this company would do, and uh, do everything I can to make it, to make it successful. And, um, and so I started looking for opportunities. Um, FinTech at the time, um, you know, speaking about 2010-11, wasn't really a thing yet. And, um, and so I felt there was an opportunity uh, to do something more innovative. And I came across small business lending, which um, you know is very widely um, seen as a, as an underserved um, underserved industry, and um, and I felt technology could make a, a great difference in um, in helping small businesses access financing in a better way. I really liked the idea that I could help an individual sm small business owner coming from this big organization um, that was coming from the idea that I could help an individual person directly. Um, was was very motivating to me, and um, and I felt if we do this a million times over, we can also create mm -hmm. some prosperity for the economy. And uh, these are still the two things that are really driving me, and um, and uh, and us as a company to uh, to continue to evolve. That's really really inspirational, Christoph. And I'm curious, did you have any mentors um, or supporters when you first started out, or was there any piece of specific advice that you still remember this day that you received as in your early days? Before I, I I started the company, coming from a from a you know big trading floor, I had no idea what it meant to uh, to run my own business. I was really a complete novice to all of it. And um, and so I spent some time interning in um, in several other um, startups, and um, and that was uh, very very beneficial to just understand what digital marketing is. You know, I still remember when in, in one of those startups, um, someone asked me, so, "So what is your customer acquisition cost at Goldman?" Uh, keep in mind that my clients were Novartis, and <laughs> these times, you know, you know, you had really sort of two two worlds clashing um, towards each other. But I spend a lot of time um, speaking to other entrepreneurs, to angel investors, VC investors, and um, and and someone, um, you know, actually a few of them. But the advice that you know I kept on hearing is, do not do it as a solo founder. Um, you know, start with another, uh, with someone else. And um, and I think that was a great piece of advice, and um, and and one that I've taken to heart. And I think that turned out really well for for us. So let's talk about your co-founder, James. How did you meet him? And what was the first decision you made together? Uh, so, um, so I've been looking uh, for someone that has um, different skills to mine, which is uh, basically someone that understands technology, um, that has um, a more quantitative background to mine to, to, to help us manage our risk, which um, you know, is, is very much around machine learnings. And um, you know, these were not necessarily skills that I had to the degree that I felt comfortable with, and um, and so I was looking for someone um, with these skills, and um, and you know at the time, as I said, fintech wasn't a big thing, um, but there was one fintech meetup, um, and I saw that James posted his, um, his his profile and that he would be going there, and he has a PhD in theoretical physics. He was a quant trader, 
at the time at uh, Deutsche Bank, and he was uh, coding from age eight on. So I felt, you know, this is this is my guy. This must be it. Um, so I went to this meetup, and um, and he was actually there. So for anyone who knows James, that in itself is a miracle. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, there was maybe sixty people. I found him. We spoke. Um, he he actually thought that was a good idea. And uh, and we ended up working together. It was um, the biggest the biggest luck um, ever. And That's um, a great story. <laughs> and, uh, and and you know we're quite complementary in our skill sets. And um, and uh, and we're still um, we're still together in the company. And uh, both of us have a very deep trust in each other and and have our, our each other's back. So that was um, you know it's a, this this kind of type of luck that you need when you're starting a business that can make. Um, a, uh, a huge difference, make it or break it. So without James, I don't think we'd be here. I love that. And, you know, we hear that a lot of Innovate Finance. It's so much based on the relationships and the trust, and you can really build something amazing when, you, when you've got that across a team. Uh, so that's really lovely to hear, Christoph. So let's talk a little bit about Iwoga, because the two of you have really just created something absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you founded Iwoga back in 2012 to really tackle the huge funding gap in business finance. Has your vision and your mission changed at all over the years? No, um, we're really still um, uh, about serving small businesses, um, trying um, whatever we can to fill this funding gap. Um, that that did not change. Um, that mission um, is unwavered and our commitment to it is unwavered. Um, but we obviously did um, progress uh, hugely over, over these years and um, and things that we're doing today, you know, we didn't really think about um, when when we started. But um, the mission itself, I think, is still is still the same. And what flexibility do you offer your customers that other business platforms, business lending platforms, don't? Just a much better experience in uh, in, in in service. So our personal best uh, from a cold start of an application of a small business to us. Um, you know, putting money into into their bank account is three minutes and twenty six seconds. Um, that that you know, that sort of one of um, I think the proof points of um, how technology and data and data processing and the great user experience um, really make make a big difference. You know, that's our personal best. It's not you know the 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 average time that we have, but I think the the convenience that we've brought and the access accessibility make a huge huge difference. Uh, we've also brought um, financing into many other places um, where where our, our customers can access it. So it's not anymore that uh, people necessarily come to our website. Um, um, it's um, they 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 can access financing through our network of partners, through which we reach uh, more than a billion and a half businesses directly. So the API platform um, that we've built over over the years is becoming increasingly powerful. I'm sure we'll be spending a bit more time, so I don't, you know, want to go to, <laughs> to all of the um, the um, the bits that we have changed. But I think we have made a um, we have made a lot of progress just um, getting the best out of technology and data to to offer offer financing to businesses. So, if there were three myths to bust about business lending, what would they be? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think the uh, the first myth is uh, that, that the banks have an 80% approval rate. Yep. That's just totally not true. Uh, they have it on their website, uh, but, it, but it's, uh, you know, and anyone that knows a little bit about small businesses know that um, the people that, where well, they might say they have an 80% approval rate, they're also highly pre-filtered um, across their own customer base um, to actually get a decision. I think they're largely overstating um, their, their ability to fund small businesses. So I think that that is probably in small business lending one of the biggest myths. Um, the second one is um, that um, for many small businesses, they still feel if, you, if your bank says no, that no financing is available to you. Hmm. And, um, and I think we, um, alongside uh, many, many other lenders, um, have really... Um, um, harness technology and data in, in a way that we can we can offer funding to customers that are just falling out these still often fairly rigid systems and and processes and criteria that uh, that banks are setting 
So I gave, I gave you two. Yeah. Um, um, sure. You know, I'm sure there are more, but I think those two, to me, would be the ones that are more sticking out. Two, two is good. And I think your last point about the fact that if they're turned down, they, they, they feel there's not necessarily anywhere else or any other options. I'd love to dig into this one a bit more. And I think particularly if we look at the context over the last 18 months and with the pandemic as well and the change to the ecosystem there, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are around both how the industry has grown over the times of crisis, either grown or changed, uh, and also how the pandemic has directly affected Iwoka. Um, yeah, that's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. The, um, let me sort of take the first bit of your question, uh, first, um, and it sort of, it does relate to the pandemic. So it's actually comes in quite, quite nicely together. So, um, if you, um, if you, uh, uh, look at what happened over the last 12 years, the 12, 12 months, uh, you've really seen that, um, um, fintech lenders, um, have been providing a sem substantial amount of lending uh, to small businesses alongside the banks in uh, in the Seabill scheme, and um, you know, and that's a message that we have been sending uh, to the public and, and the government um, at the onset of the uh, of the crisis that we as um, fintech lenders have huge capabilities that we have built up, and um, and that can we can make a, a big difference. Sadly, um, these capabilities weren't taken up for the bounce back loan scheme, which um, the way it was structured is really uniquely um, uh, was targeted at the at the largest banks. And you know, Starling has been quite successful there as well. But it was really um, to the, the 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 big five banks, and um, and anyone else wasn't able to offer it. Um, but through Seabolt, which was a scheme um, where um, lots of um, fintech lenders were participating. I think we could show that we took um, probably 30, 40 percent of the entire lending was uh, was coming through us, and I think that really marks um, the um, the capabilities that we have built, the difference that we can make, and I hope we can continue to capitalize it. Um, and we have shown that at you know at a time where we were all uh, most um, most under stress. Yeah. I, I Thing that's phenomenal and I know we're working together to put some uh, some additional data behind the absolute power uh, of the the non bank lending space and I think we've seen that more than anything during during COVID and during the period. I'm curious if there are other challenges that you think the industry has faced beyond the pandemic over the past 10 years uh, and and how the industry really pulled through or what some of the big milestones were there. The um yeah, it's you know it's not been a smooth ride in the UK for the last uh, few years. So you know since 2016 with the Brexit referendum, yeah. um, <clears throat> we have seen a lot of uncertainty um, in the entire economy. You know, small business owners didn't quite know um, where where the journey would be going for them. Europe is um, in many cases their largest trading partner, so it's not you know it's it's not um, a great starting point if you know whether that relationship um, will continue to be functioning for them. And um, and so for for a number of years we had um, we had um, this uncertainty and it was a, a, a distraction um, really for 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 everybody. So I think you know that was certainly in the sort of um, years that um, I've been uh, growing this company was certainly something that slowed us down. And then um, and then of course the pandemic, um, as we said, had a massive impact. But it's. Um, you know, it's often how, we, how you respond to um, to a crisis, and um, and I think um, you know, looking back the twelve months, I'm incredibly proud of the entire Walker team, as well as lots of other people that we've been working with, um, how we've been responding to it, and how we've used this period of stress to um, um, to continue to invest in our platform, to make changes to it, to the capabilities that we've built over the last twelve months. Um, so for Siebel's, for example, we have um, issued nearly 400 million pounds to 1,500 businesses. And we were able to prove that we can um, continue yeah. to serve um, businesses even, you know, in the time where they where they need us most. So, you know, every every crisis in the sense, um, um, you know, also shows how, how, how resilient you are. And I think they made us they made us stronger, although, you know, it, it's certainly been a grind over the last um, over the last 12 months. But yeah. Now, looking back at it, um, I'm also really proud on, on how everyone mastered it. 
And, and I was actually just going to echo and say you should be incredibly proud because what IWOKE has accomplished over the past 12 to 18 months is phenomenal as a team and also in terms of how you've supported SMEs across uh, the, the entirety of the UK. And I'm, I'm curious that from a leadership perspective, this has been challenging because suddenly you have a position where everyone has gone from being in the office and building off one another's energy as a small team or as a growing team to suddenly, in many cases, being very remote for a very long time. So I'm curious uh, to hear from you. Did your leadership strategy shift? How did the team take it? What did you, how did you really adjust in terms of the crisis and what was it like leading throughout the crisis? <laughs> yeah, I think you had um, the, the double one. We, you are uh, both remote uh, and not as close to each other. So it's it's harder to read um, also um, what is on people, people's mind. And then, um, you know, and, and everyone was um, uh, personally in a, in a very different environment all of a sudden with, um, you know, their family members um or friends eventually affected um by the crisis so you know the, the the personal toll that um that it took um was was certainly large and um and it is a people's business you know no <laughs> um you don't write code or content or speak to customers um through machines you know everything that we do is um uh, is done is done by people and therefore you know our people are our most important ingredients to be uh to be successful so the second bit, uh, we, we've also done this under enormous stress. Um, you know, in 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 the first, um, you know, directly after the lockdown um, in Q two, um, our customers didn't quite know uh, where this was going, and uh, we provided a huge amount of support to them. Our call volumes um, were a hundred percent higher than they usually are. So, so not only do you have this personal toll of the of the of the situation of how your own sort of um, life has changed but you know we were also under extra enormous stress um on on the business at the same time and um and um and then all of the schemes um happened um you know we, we were updating our customers on the ever-changing guidance um by the by the government we were building the seabelt scheme um really within within record time so the, 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 the output um, has never been greater, if you want, in a time where everyone was personally quite stressed. But from a, you know, you, you kind of mentioned leadership um, um, perspective, it, um, I, I think the things that are I important to us, uh, sort of critical to us um, and, and the community just became more important in, mm -hmm. in these months and we really could rely on those. So number one, we've always been a highly transparent um, company um, there's relatively little data that uh, I would know that um, you know the, the sort of most junior person in the company wouldn't have access to, and it was very important to me to be very clear throughout this period um, to tell the team exactly where we were standing, how it impacts us as a company, um, you know our, our finances, and, um, and 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 making sure that they um they, they feel and know that um there isn't anything that they don't know which kind of might come as a negative surprise um and i think that made the sort of um you know quite granular and frequent uh, communication of just you know what happened how it affects us how it affects them is um, um has been very important and i think we have done this well um the second bit i think um which is also very important is um, that uh, we trust people to make decisions and make decisions based on the information that they have and diligently getting the right input of information but that we're generally uh, avoiding um, and, and therefore don't really have that um, um, committees so they're not decisions by committees but the decisions taken by people and, uh, and and typically that is not me making the decisions it's the team but the um, you know the the, the 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 this culture and this leadership that you trust your people to make to make the right decisions um i think is very important and um and diversity of thought is very important to us um we have um, um we have various backgrounds of of people in it and that feeds into this into this culture and then um you know the the sort of um <clears throat> The community that we have fostered is also very strong. We have a deep sense of caring uh, for each other, and um, and I've seen um, how um, our people's team 
Um, I've been supporting people that were more affected um, than others personally. And, um, and we started offering also uh, more expert uh, mental health support um, to those um, that uh, were really struggling. And, you know, all of us were struggling at some point. Um, but I think it was, um, it was uh, really important to provide this additional um, layer of help that we internally wouldn't be able to provide. Yeah. So I think, you know, you know, this might sort of be a broader sort of sense of culture, but I think leadership is about forming a culture that works and fosters a strong, strong community. And I think these were the main points that, um, that we already had in us and that we could really focus on to, to get through this as good as we can. That's great, Christoph. And, and it's so interesting because I think, if anything, the pandemic has really just shown how our working lives ultimately blend so much into our personal lives. If we're doing something we're passionate about, it should really be all essentially bringing it all together. So I think that's really, really key. Now, we've also seen during the pandemic just a huge focus on how important technology is in really every single area of our life, but particularly when it comes to financial services. Do you think that this was a, per a turning point for the industry in that there will be now a renewed focus on how important, how critical fintech is and technology more broadly is uh, to the evolution of the sector? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, the adoption of, of digitization has uh, leapfrogged a number of years. I mean, it was a trend that you know, has been in process for, for, for quite a while. And, um, and you know, things that happened would have happened anyway. But um, the, the speed with which um, people, you know, adopted apps of all sorts of um, parts of their life has just been incredible. And that clearly feeds through also in, um, in, in, in finance and, um, and, and, and lending. And while from a lending perspective to SMEs, last year was obviously um, very special because a lot of the lending was done through government schemes. Some of them were fully automated and obviously all digital. Um, you know, now you're seeing a return to a more normal um, lending lending market and and I think it will mean that um, people will um, uh, many more people will be open um, to to go to marketplaces or to to raise financing through digital platforms like us so yeah I think for us um, um, definitely it will will accelerate the the adoption and what about this concept of trust because this is something we've always talked about for years, obviously, in, in fintech and financial services. And I know at the height of the pandemic last year, Nesta put out a really interesting report, which essentially said there was a huge increase in the amount of trust uh, that their respondents and the consumers had with regards to banking and mobile money apps. Do you feel that we'll see an impact on the trust that consumers and SMEs have with regards to fintechs and using these new platforms? Yeah, I, I do think so. I mean, in the end, you 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 trust things because they work, and um, yeah. and, and 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 I think a lot of the um, the services that are provided today by technology work generally better than if they if they're not provided um, by by technology providers, just because the processes and 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 the systems are are, are more reliable. And um, and so I think um, you know that that that's um, something that has benefited. Uh, last year and um, you know in in our sort of um, um, product it's um, it's it's not that we are an anonymous um, service and, and company we do and we know that our customers value um, service very much um, so we've always been investing in um, in being really available to our customers if they're if they're having questions if they're looking uh, for 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 help um, and um, and even in the in in the darkest um, days of of the crisis, um, we were um, customers that were calling us. Got um, you know at the time where we had really maximum maximum amount of people calling us, we were picking up the phones um, in more than seventy percent of the cases within uh, within within seconds. And that was during a period where people were literally for days in queues with a, with the big banks. And, um, and so I think um, the, the, the trust in, in, in lenders like us has um, certainly rather increased versus other service providers that uh, were more dominant. Fair. 
So, Christoph, let's change tack a little bit and look at the future and what we need to do to ensure really that both IWOCA but other companies and fintechs that are leading the way can continue to strengthen and grow from really strength to strength. And I should add, for all our listeners out there, we are taking questions at the end of this session. So please do, do feel free to add them in and we'll address them at the very end. But we obviously have just seen the, the launch of the Khalifa report earlier this year, which talks a lot about what is necessary to continue the UK's leadership as a global fintech hub. I'm quite keen to hear from you what areas you think are absolutely necessary for us to continue to grow as a global leader in financial technology. One area that I'm, I'm really excited about is digital ID. Yeah. And it's... Uh, Every single time a customer comes to us and um, you know you have to perform many, many AML and KYC checks. And, um, and for SMEs, they're, they're, they're particular cumbersome because an SME might have shareholders, they might have directors. So if, we are, if we're able to um, create a digital ID um, for businesses, that would make a huge, huge difference in, um, in further innovation and, and just better services that could be provided. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite, you know, it's been a topic that's obviously been talked about for quite a while. Uh, but I do believe that there's a growing, um, that there's a growing support um, from the government um, in, and regulators in achieving that. So I think that that can make a big difference, particularly makes a difference, of course, for um, for smaller transaction uh, sizes where the um, uh, where the amount of, 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 of checks that you need to make, um, if it's a relatively small transaction amount, you know, in the sort of low thousands is um, is just disproportionate. If you if you can automate those things with a digital ID, I think that you would see a lot of of um, additional innovation coming to the market. Second bit um, that um, you know I think um, will be um, a, a big topic is the uh, in you know in particular in, in, in small business lending is that banks have given out uh, bounce back loans to one point five million businesses and uh, many of these businesses uh, will use these funds to, um, to, to, to pluck cash flow gaps um, from, from the crisis, but then they need additional investment um, to now take advantage of the, the recovery. And I think that the, the banks will find it difficult um, to serve this group of customers, which they already underserved in the past, um, you know, good enough um, to really give us as an as a, as a nation, as an economy, the ability to bounce back as high as we can. And so I really hope um, that um, that we can find solutions together with the bank, hopefully market-led, but certainly with the support of the government to um, um, to make this funding available, even though the, you know, the, the banks might not be the best place to, um, to provide it. Uh, so, you know, hopefully on those two, we'll make progress. Uh, the, the second one, hopefully very soon, um, for the first one, the digital passport, I think it might take a while. It's a really, both two really interesting points. And obviously, I know you sit on, uh, or Iwoka sits on the task force that Innovate Finance has alongside UK Finance in terms of working on digital ID and supporting DCMS around the trust framework as well, because it's absolutely critical, as you say, really to the, the future momentum for financial innovation. Um, and particularly on the second point, something that we advocate for very strongly when it comes to regulation is, of course, we need to protect the consumer. At the end of the day, that's what's most important. But we can't then forget about how beneficial this innovation actually is to the end consumer. So having a regulatory framework in place that both protects the consumer, but also balances the line between allowing innovation to flourish uh, because ultimately we're all trying to get to the same goal of, of making a better experience for the consumer at the end of the day. So really, really two very key points. Is there any other regulatory or legislative change that you would like to see to make the environment sort of continuing to be strong for the fintechs? Cost of capital um, is, is certainly the third one. Um, that would be great if you would find a solution for non-banks um, to have um, uh, better access to financing um, at lower cost than we currently do through wholesale uh, financing channels, and um, and I think you know given the the amount of lending that we were able to bring to the market, um, I hope that this is giving us um, even more reasons why this should be considered to have um, find a way how we can get access to central bank funding in a similar way as the banks do. Um, 
but maybe based on the collateral that we have on on, on SMEs. But I believe if um, if we were finding a solution which would enable us to drop our own financing costs um, closer to the the area where banks are, then uh, I think the uh, competition in the market um, directly with the banks to be able um, um, to compete with them uh, eye to eye, if you wish, um, would be um, delivering significantly better customer outcomes than um, than is currently um, the case. So I think that's the third bit um, that I'd be be mentioning that can make a real difference. Good, good. So changing tax slightly, I know that IWOCA is leading the way in embedded finance. What does that mean for the industry, for SMEs, and for IWOCA as well? Uh, it's transforming, uh, I think, the way how SMEs are accessing financing. Um, so today, the majority of finance is still delivered by the banks of an SME going to a bank. And I think that's simply changing. Um, if you are an SME and uh, you know there's no reason why you wouldn't get access to finance through your bookkeeping software, for example, uh, which has a lot more relevant data on your business anyway than the, than the bank does. So I think, you know, this is one example is um, you'll see a number of um, new, really big um, 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 distribution channels uh, developed to this way. And um, financing is not um, the, the, the core activity of a bookkeeping software. And so, um, um, Lenders like us can embed our our financing offering really very seamlessly in into into the uh, workflows um, of these services, and so a business can access financing, you know, through a few um, clicks. Um, you know, it's a much better process than they're currently being offered by the bank. So that, you know, that's one example of, of of embedded financing. But I think marketplaces also play a big role. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you and I as consumers um, wouldn't probably, um, you know, think differently than going to a, a marketplace to get a car insurance. You know, that's completely normal. When you look for a car insurance, you kind of say, I need a car insurance. You end up at one of the marketplaces and you have a host of offers that are available to you to pick the one that, that suits you best. It's a relatively seamless experience. And I think the same thing will happen also in SME lending. And in many ways, has happened already in consumer lending. So I think marketplaces is another great example of, of, of embedding financing in a platform to make it imminently available. And I think that's a trend that, uh, that will accelerate now after, after the pandemic. Yeah. And then there are all of the other sort of service providers that, that you know, find it useful to, um, to offer financing to their businesses. And technology is now as that far, you know, we've proven this with our API platform, that it's um, that it's um, technically feasible and really quite simple for these businesses um, to embed financing into their offering, and um, and I think that's um, you know that that's at the core what will really change how how SMEs are accessing financing. I think it's probably the most exciting trend that we see in SME finance. Okay. I hope we'll speak a little bit about I Walk a Pay, which is another example of it. But um, you know, maybe I'll I'll stop here. Let's well. Let's talk now about iWokapay. So you you've also launched iWokapay. Tell us about the product uh, and what problems it solves. So, so uh, iWokapay is a is a product that we launched last year. And if we you know if, if I look at the experience that I've made over the last few years in SME lending, businesses come to us because um, they have a cash flow gap or they want to make an investment, and they have a cash flow gap because they're waiting for invoices to be paid. Uh, while well, they have to pay their suppliers or their staff. They identify the cash need, um, they come to us, we, we, we fill that gap. But in essence, um, it's not really solving the problem at its root. Um, and, it, and, and the root for uh, many businesses is that um, they're selling something to their customers and, 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 and have delayed payment terms. But the buyers themselves would uh, benefit from variable repayment terms to fit exactly um, their cash mm -hmm. needs. So that's essentially uh, what, what we're building with our Walker Pay. Um, in every invoice that um, one of our customers sends to their customers, uh, their customers can choose um, across a, a number of payment terms that suit them best. You know, may that be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. But it's the, it's the buyer that ultimately is choosing 
um, how long they need to pay for an invoice while we are able to pay um, um, the seller immediately. And that's why I'm saying it's a great example of embedded finance. It's the purest form of embedded finance where every small business is able to offer financing as part of their core business of providing yeah. services or selling, selling their goods. And, uh, and that essentially is, um, is again able, uh, enabled through technology. We have an integration with Zero, for example, uh, where um, our customers were selling um, automatically on every invoice they create at our Pay as a payment option. And that option enables their customers to either pay immediately through an instant bank transfer or choose how long um, they would like until they pay their invoice. And, you know, I think that's a perfect example of it. And I think it's, a, it's another uh, very exciting product that I'm looking to grow over the next few years. Fab, good. So, Christoph, you mentioned then your partnership with Zero, and I would love to hear from you why you think tech partnerships are so critical uh, to the alternative lending space in particular, and any other stories that you can share. And what do you think is really makes these partnerships work? I mean, the, the, for every partnership um, to make it work, you need to have both parties um, see a see a real real benefit and. And I think um, um, for for partners like 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 Zero, they have um, you know really lots of services that are hugely value adding um, to their um, to their to their business customers, and um, and so financing is something that um, that they identified as a clear need for their customers, and you know they have the right; they're perfectly well positioned. Um, uh, the right in, in in the sense of the customer to provide it to them and um and so i think you know if 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 you have a partner that is um so well positioned uh, to provide financing to really in the future nearly act in a way as a bank would do today by providing all these sorts um of of, of products um that are best in market but not necessarily all delivered by them you have the potential for um, um, for really game changing new player in the finance market to offer financing to to their customers, and so we were hugely excited um, to win zero as part of our BCR grant that we won two years ago, and uh, to bring them to market um, with a with a financing financing solution. That's the first bit. You know, it has to kind of make sense for for both parties, of course. The second bit is we generally make much better experience to work with partners that are technology companies themselves, because in essence, we're offering it. You know, we're offering software, a technology which um, which only really works when both parties have a speak a similar language on 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 how the user experience will happen on on their end, and that have the capabilities. To offer it in the in the same seamless way, um, the way they present it to their customers, as we offer it um, through our APIs, and um, these are the two main ingredients. Yeah. Well, so in terms of next steps for iWoka, so you've told us a lot about iWoka Pay, which is really exciting. Is there anything else on the horizon that we should be looking out for? Yes. But I won't be able to talk about it today. <laughs> well, then you've heard it here first, so we'll we'll do another follow up, and we'll be able, we'll be able to hear that. Looking out for some good news. Very, there very, very happy to, but we need to wait <laughs> um, for for a few more a few more weeks, um, actually. But um, there's there are a few things that we're working on that I think are very exciting that I haven't mentioned yet. But good. good. The team well, will kill me if okay. I talk You'll about hear it here. We, We've got you then the next segment, so we'll make sure to Please. bring you back. Please. We've got a couple minutes left, um, and I'm aware a few questions have come in from the audience too. So one is asking, Christoph, has the SME market, I'm assuming the, the business lending market, become a specific area of interest for investors? Uh, absolutely. Um, we've, seen, um, uh, we've seen a number of SME lenders uh, raising capital recently, um, and so I think it's um, it's definitely a market that uh, that investors are attracted to and invested in, as long as you can show that you have um, great capabilities, maybe even unique capabilities. Um, but you know, despite sort of the challenges that we've had last year for those who have been 
um, surviving well and emerging well and coming out um, stronger, um, there's definitely interest from the investor base. Good. And then in terms of some additional questions, the UK market for growing a fintech it clearly has quite a bit of strength to it uh, as a global leader. Are there things that we can either learn from other markets or, or areas that really the UK dominates in terms of its strength? The UK is quite good um in a in a global um comparison i think um you know we've been shouting about this um for, for for many years the collaboration between the regulator um you know the, the government and the sort of entire industry the emergence of open banking which i think was um was big and is is, is much better than um what we see in other places of the world i think the um um, the UK has more to offer to export um, than, than necessarily to import. Uh, and did you have any thoughts? Uh, one of the key pieces out of the Khalifa review was obviously around the skills and talent piece. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that front? Or are there any other recommendations that you feel are absolutely critical that have come out of the Khalifa review? It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a it's a topic we've been discussing for many for many years. Talent is absolutely critical, and um, and long term we can only solve it by investing much more in education, much more in in in, in relevant subjects that people are being attracted to. That you know are more geared towards you know on the one hand side data, on the other side creativity. Um, and I think you know that that's kind of what we need to to focus on short term. I. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not a big win that uh, we now have an additional process to um, where we're recruiting people from from continental Europe. Um, and while the visa scheme, you know, as far as I've seen it, is um, you know reasonably feasible, um, it's just another friction. And and I think um, you know over time, I hope we can make it as smooth as as, as possible. But um, not being able to as easily tap talent um, from, from continental Europe is, is certainly not helpful. So I hope that um, we'll find ever better ways how we can um, get back to a similar state that we had before from a recruiting perspective. Yeah, excellent. And I know you're feeding into some of the roundtables we have to trying to shape the scale up visa as well. So hopefully we we're on a good road forward. I think in the last few minutes we've got, because it's been so interesting to hear your perspective and your journey, Christoph, I'd love to focus really on maybe the past 18 months and any learnings that you've taken out of this pandemic, both on a professional and a personal level? <laughs> um, well, it's been a very intense period and um, learnings. Um, you know, I touched on sort of the, um, what do you call leadership bit uh, yeah. on a few things. So I think, you know, there were, there were definite learnings and, and I think, you know, there were lots of things that, that, um, we, we 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 got right where the culture that we had helped us um, to get to get through this. You know, one bit that um, I um, I learned is uh, not learned, and and it sounds sadly sort of sounds a bit cliche, but I think it is. There's a lot of truth to it. It's um, it's not that you want to be defined by a crisis itself, but by the response to it. And and I think you know that's what I learned yet again over over the last year and it's as true in your personal life as it is you know for a company or in your professional life and um and i'm just proud how um so many people responded well to um take on the challenge to really go the extra mile um and go through this grind that um, the situation you know provided us with um and we responded well and that's why um you know so many of us have gone through this um pretty um pretty well but it's um you know if you look back over the 18 months, all of us at some point would said, you know, I got enough of this, you know, I can't take it anymore. And, um, and rightly so, yeah. <laughs> so it, was really, you know, it was a really <laughs> shitty period, but, um, and then, you know, there were dark days, um, but it's, um, you know, to pick yourselves up and to respond as well as you can, uh, take a step back, uh, breathe and, uh, and then move on. Um, I think that, uh, that certainly helped. It's really true. Very, and very will, will help for any future crisis. For any future crisis. Very true. So, Christoph, last question for you. And this is a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, in our audience listening in today. 
if you had one piece of advice that you would give to a fintech founder or a future fintech founder, what would it be? Uh, find find um, find a co-founder. <laughs> um, find find someone that is as great as as James that makes lots of things so much easier. Uh, that's definitely um, you know my 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 advice that I benefited so much from that I would give to anyone else. Fab. Well, those are words to live by. Uh, and Christoph, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It was so interesting and really inspiring to hear your story. And it's phenomenal what you've done with IWOCA and how much you've supported really the entire ecosystem and the SMEs. So thank, thank you. you very much for joining us. Thank you, listeners, for joining and, us this and, afternoon. And, and Janine, and as you alluded to on the talent um, piece, we're actively hiring. So um, anyone who would like to join <laughs> and um, work on the things that you know, that, that, that I said we can't talk about right now and, and many others, <laughs> um, please um, please ping me or, or anyone at Iwaka. We're, we're, keen, we're keen to welcome you. Good. Well, you've heard it here, so get the applications in. Uh, and uh, thank you, Christoph, again. And thank you, listeners, so much for joining us. And we'll see you at our next session for Innovate Finance. In the meantime, visit our, our website or reach out to the team. Uh, and we look forward to continuing these great programs. So thanks, Christoph, so much. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. You too.